Yeah, I uh, have some interesting thoughts on the stuff that we just heard about, but at a slightly different angle. So, Steffi, thank you for inviting me. I mean, it's been a long day already, an amazing day. So many fantastic speakers, so it's going to be a tough act to follow on all uh, the amazing subjects. But I think we heard some interesting thoughts on the inter intersection of biology and how we build things. And what I would like to do is look at it from a slightly different angle and with a different subject. So, many of you are familiar with 3D printing, right? Relatively simple plastic printers have already changed how makers everywhere are interacting with the Internet of Things. And, but of course, there's more to 3D printing than just that. Industrial 3D printing is increasingly changing how we think about manufacturing. You can print, today you can print almost every conceivable material, including metals, high strength steel, titanium. You can print glass, optical surfaces even. You can print heat resistant ceramics. And of course, you can print everybody's favorite, which is chocolate. We've even sent 3D printers up to space. This printer here is from a company aptly named, named in, uh, Made in Space Incorporated, and they have a printer up on the International Space Station. 3D printing is also playing an increasing role in biotech, where scientists are making the first forays into printing artificial organs, livers and kidneys. But it's important to understand <clears throat> that Wait, wait, wait. But it's important to understand that we did not really fundamentally change how we built things in a long while. So, it all started really, if you think about it, a million years ago, when one of our really early ancestors tied a rock to a stick and had a tool. A major breakthrough in manufacturing technology at that time. Then things progressed slowly at first, but then increasingly faster until we ended up with all the amazing things that we can build today. But it's really similar to <clears throat> what we... It's really similar to what we've been doing all the way. We did not fundamentally change the way we build things, right? We still glue parts <clears throat> together, we screw them together, we... Complexity is always difficult, right? The more refined the object, the more energy and time we have to spend on it. So, clearly if we've come a long way, but there is a builder out there that routinely outperforms us in almost every way. So let's look at nature, right? So let's look at these trees here. These trees here are more complex than anything we humans have ever built. There's one possible exception that I will get to later on. But each tree here self-assembled according to an incredibly complex plan, molecule by molecule, and nature built the perfect tree for this specific environment and this specific location. This plant here is more complex than anything else in this building. So we have nothing that comes even close to the sophistication of this build process yet. But each tree here, but with our 3D printers, we are beginning to mimic just a little bit what nature does. 3D printing is also called additive manufacturing. Because instead of cutting stuff away, we are slowly adding piece by piece little molecules on top of each other. So, just like a living organism, this 3D printer here adds material according to a plan. Oh, the video is not happening. Anyway, so imagine an amazing 3D printer playing here. So, a 3D printer adds material according to a plan. Just like nature, complexity is not a problem because it doesn't really matter if I print something straight or curved with a complex pattern or without. The cost and build time is only affected by the amount of material that I need to use. Just like a tall tree 
takes longer to grow than a small flower. And that is a fundamental change in the way we build things. Up until today, more complexity always meant more cost, more energy, more raw material consumed, and consequently more environmental impact. With additive manufacturing, complexity is essentially free, provided that you have a plan, and that is a new challenge. 3D printers are becoming more and more sophisticated every day. But there's something missing. They are still being fed by software technology that was designed for the old way of building things. So in the old way of building things, an engineer crafts an object piece by piece and then assembles a com complex product, very similar to the physical pro uh, process that he's aiming for. While this works for now, it's incredibly limiting. So how does nature create its plans? Well, the plan is stored in the DNA, right? And it took millions of years to evolve. So that will, will not work for us, right? We don't have that much time to design our products. We won't wait for our cell phone to grow you know, for, millions, for a million years. So to unlock the true potential of 3D printing, we need to, to change the engineering paradigm as well. When designing things, we can take clues from nature, but we ultimately have to move beyond it. So in January, I started a new company called Hyperganic to help engineers create more complex designs. We are moving to a model where building an object is more about describing what properties it should have in what environment it needs to function. And then the software will get to work and create something that hopefully fits the build. Engineers in the near future will probably be more like botanists who try to combine multiple tri traits to get the right outcome. So just as an example, if you want to 3D print a liver, you don't want to design the blood vessels and lay them out like an engineer currently lays out the cooling channels in a rocket engine, for example. No, you want to describe what properties you need, and then you want to have an algorithm that figures out how the blood reaches all the parts of the organ. But having mentioned rocket engines, there's no reason why the cooling channels of a rocket engine cannot look like this leaf here, and maybe they will actually work better, right? So if I look at an aircraft wing today, I see a marvel of human engineering. But at the same time, if that were the perfect way to transform energy into flight, our airplanes would probably, our birds would probably look like that. And they don't. They look like this. And you know, Everything we've built so far really pales against this comp comparison. I mean, anybody who's seen a dolphin swim effortlessly next to a speedboat, and the speedboat is burning hundreds of liters of gasoline while the dolphin runs on what? A few sardines she ate early in the morning. So I mean, clearly, we can do more in terms of efficiency, let alone freedom of design. So maybe you're thinking right now, this is all science fiction stuff. You know, this is all 100 years in the future, and I will not see any of this in my lifetime. Well, prediction is difficult, especially when it's about the future, a famous Niels Bohr quote. But I believe that within the next two decades, we are going to turn the world of manufacturing on its head. And the clock is already ticking and we will make a lot of progress in just a few years. So when I talked about complexity earlier, I said there's one example where human ingenuity has potentially already surpassed what nature does, or at least it's on the same level, and that is computer technology. So at first, computers looked like 
that one up here. And you know, obviously, they were all handcrafted and designed by the finest minds of the century. And then they started to look like that. And um, they were still assembled from many parts, and you still needed the brightest minds of the century to get to that. But then they started to look like that. And today, we humans no longer design these kinds of circuits from scratch and wire them together. A chip designer today is a person who is really good at describing what problems he wants to solve in a fairly abstract way. And then the computer will actually generate a design that can then be manufactured. So it has been done before, and it did not take that much time. Manufacturing will start operating under Moore's law pretty soon. And this is important, because we need to rather sooner than later. We're wasting so many valuable resources. We are consuming tremendous amounts of energy, and we are not living up to the true potential of our creativity. Because right now, complexity is dirty and expensive. Today, we are literally consuming our planet, a planet that we have only borrowed from our children. We need to get smarter about the way we build things. But with this paradigm shift, I believe we can get back on track to leaving our children a better world, just like our grandparents did for us. I want to finish up with a video that hopefully will play that the Hyperganic team created that will hopefully spark your creative thinking about what this change could mean for you and all of us. Look at us. We did amazing things. We can build rockets, skyscrapers, enormous ships. Most of these started with a simple idea. But then it got complex. We needed a lot of tools. We needed a lot of parts. And we needed a lot of time to build just one thing. Especially when we were trying to imitate nature. But why? What if we could make things simpler and grow the product just like nature does? What if complexity were not an issue anymore? Wouldn't we build even more amazing things? What would the world look like? Just imagine the possibilities. So, what would you build? So let's build some amazing stuff, shall we? Thank you very much. Oh, we already have water. Thank you so much for your insights on 3D printing, mimicry in nature. So our next star on stage is uh, very young. It just has been born a couple of weeks ago in small Taufkirchen. And it's, a, it's his first appearance in public on exclusively this conference at DLD. And let me welcome with the world first 3D printed motorbike. It will be presented by Joachim Zettler. He's CEO of AP Works. AP Works is a sort of startup subsidiary of Airbus. Bring it up. It's light white. It weighs half the, it's half the weight of my weight. <laughs> so it's a 30 whatever kilo. <laughs> it's very speedy. It's fully electronic. And it's uh, still a baby. So give a big hand for Joachim Zettler, CEO of AP Works. So, Joachim, yep. amazing. You just lifted a motorcycle onto the stage. Yeah, you, I mean, you it's know, not a I Harley mean, Davidson, but you would have, ha have, but, but have a hard time to, to actually bring it up. Yeah, look at my body. I mean, it's. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> You're a very strong guy. So, I think this is a first that somebody drove a motorcycle onto the DLD stage. So, tell me a little bit about this motorcycle. I mean, it looks very different than a regular motorcycle would look like. It, it actually fits uh, just your talk. Um, the design, this is not an industrial engine, 
uh, engineering design. It is a design that is uh, entirely numerically driven. We use human principles to come to a design that is entirely based on, a, on the force flow. So uh, it, we, we took some boundary conditions, the weight of a driver, typically 120 kilogram max, some damage boundary conditions if you crash this bike, um, actually inspired by BMW, to be honest. And, and in the end, you get such a frame which might not look like that it is withstanding any load, but in the end, the frame itself is even more stiff than uh, yeah, if you compare it to traditional motorbikes. So what you're saying is that you know, when I sit on this bike, basically my weight and all the forces get distributed through this lattice work. Exactly. And uh, you ha use the, the minimum amount of material basically to create a super stable motorcycle. So how did you build it? Uh, as mentioned, it's, uh, it, the, the birth is in the computer. So uh, yeah. you use computer algorithms to, to get this kind of design, and then you use industrial and designers to smooth the surface. And last but not least, we printed it. So yeah. we, we used additive manufacturing to print each and every single part of this frame. The, the wheels and the, the suspension area, of course, the, these are just parts we bought. Uh, you probably might know them from bicycles, but the rest is printed at six kilogram in total, yeah. the whole frame. And uh, this is only possible. I mean, you usually uh, every engineer knows how to design for this, for machining, for casting, for traditional methods. But if you look at this design, you, you would not immediately jump on such a design based on your experience. This is really something only a, a compute, computationally driven uh, approach can, can provide you. So it's six kilo. I mean, so it's basically a motorcycle frame that weighs as much as a high-end bicycle frame. Yeah. yeah. And so, so you 3D printed it. So what's the material that you 3D printed it out? Um, we, we used a specific uh, self-developed material. It's an aluminum alloy called Scalm alloy. It is uh, patented by Airbus. And we, you can combine a very high strength with a high level of tactility. So I'm pretty sure nobody here knows what is tactility. It is um, if, you, if you overload a structure, usually it breaks. If there is a kind of tactility in percent in the structure, in the material, then you overload it and it starts to stretch, but it will not immediately break. So the, the higher the ductility level is, the more you can really overload the structure before it breaks. And with this material, you have a really high strength and a very high ductility so material. It's so more it's more uh, elastic. So, exactly. So what, what we're seeing right now is the outside structure. How does it look inside? I mean, so you have, you have what, we, what you see, and then you have something inside, right? Completely hollow. It's completely hollow. Yeah. So it's basically like, like the bones in our body, exactly. which are also not solid, yeah. because you want them to be as light as possible. They're yeah. actually hollow. Yeah. So you, you used a lot of uh, bionic principles on that. And uh, when I look at it, <clears throat> I see some, some elements that, that don't look like they're perfect. So was this printed in one part, or is it multiple parts? No, as you can see, there are some welding er or yeah. welding zones that were welded together. Um, this is mainly due that the printers are not big enough today. So is there any, any reason why they couldn't be bigger? <laughs> Price. It's so very it's simple. It's just I mean, a price question. Yes, it's just a price question because physically it, uh, it is possible, uh, but usually in those um, additive manufacturing processes, it is not like the one you, you just showed there where somebody is just moving quickly something out of a solid oh. uh, resin. In metal printing, you, you melt metal powder only in the areas where you need to melt it, and um, therefore you need a big powder bed. So if you want to print now the whole frame in one shot, this would result in a powder bed, let's say, from here to this, to the speaker area here. So it's like this one. And you need to make sure that in each layer, and you only have 30 micron layers, so really thin layers, you have to fill in powder. Only in the area where you need it, it is melted. But yeah. you would need hundreds of kilograms of powder that are wasted, actually, in the end. Yeah. So can you it, reuse the powder? Or the, yeah. Yes, you yeah. can sieve it again, reuse yeah. it. It degrades slightly. So for aerospace applications, we probably might not be able to use it again, but for so these kinds of So speaking of which, I mean, 
you did something amazing, right? So you're part of Airbus, but you're not really part of Airbus. So tell us a little <laughs> bit about how that came about. Uh, AppWorks, we are a wholly owned subsidiary of Airbus, um, but we are an in-house startup. So I started yeah. this journey three years ago. I got an initial funding and here I am today. So we are a team of 17 people and we focus entirely on the industrialization of this technology. So yeah. our goal is in the end, th these are nice examples that combine in a perfect way design and material. But in the end, it's all about how can we industrialize these technologies to get uh, more lightweight aerospace structures, more lightweight automotive structures, and, and really get them into something that is existing today already. Yeah, and uh, so you're not getting into the motorcycle business anytime soon. Oh, actually, we have 34 pre-orders already. So oh, really? <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> we should so, rethink the business model, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. Now, um, aerospace, obviously, every kilo counts. So what are your initial things that you're targeting? You're probably not like, you know, I, I suggested targeting the wings and the, the engines. So what are the easy targets? I mean, as mentioned, due to the size of the printers, you, you currently focus on very small secondary structure parts. So nothing to worry about when you fly next time. The airplane will for sure uh, not fall down due to 3D printed parts in the next 10 years. We start with what we call class three parts. So this mm -hmm. is actually an armrest. Yeah. If it breaks, not too good, but it, it will not interfere the whole integrity of the airplane. And then this continuously will ramp up, but the parts will but, stay in But, but even these parts, I mean, it makes significant weight savings because, yes. you know, every seat has so and so many armrests and, yeah. you know, it add, adds up. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you're talking about non-security related things. I mean, what, what, what safety related things. Yes. When do you think... Uh, can we move to the next issue? Is, 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 is it just uh, a question of experience or is there something fundamental that stands in the way? Uh, you know, in the aerospace industry, even especially there, um, we are very um, safety driven. So usually within 10 years, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. With this technology now, we are already at the stage to introduce the first flying parts, metal flying parts in an airplane. This will start this year. So mm -hmm. it is already in production, meanwhile. And the more advanced parts in the wing areas, so highly loaded fat in fatigue areas, those kind of parts, we will see 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. We just need to do a little bit more exercise to understand the material behavior a little bit better and to understand the process characteristics. Yeah, great. So, I mean, other things like cars, et cetera, are probably easier targets for now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not really? If, if somebody well, from BMW is, is here, I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Formula E, maybe, yeah. right? Yeah, it's that's, only that's, the race that's a good example. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, cool. So, you know, you are already doing all the stuff that I'm talking about. It's amazing. I think uh, it's, I mean, you have two amazing achievements. One, actually printing the first 3D printed motorbike. Yeah. But secondly, I mean, congratulations on actually starting something in a big company, which is not easy. And uh, I wish you good luck with that. Yeah, thanks, Lynn. Yeah, thank you so Thank much. you. <clears throat>